Welcome to Lessons for the Journey. Lessons for the Journey is the teaching ministry of New Journey Church and Dr. David Clifton. Let's join the lesson and hear a portion of scripture to discover lessons for the journey of faith and the journey of life. Well, as I've said to you for is this the fourth week now, third week, fourth week, I think, you would think by now it would be kind of simple. You know, the words are on the page, but so much has been done in the church and outside the church to make us not accept the words that are on the page. Hopefully by now this series is shoring up some cracks and showing you exactly what scripture says what we ought to believe about what Scripture says. And it's maybe, hopefully, pushing out the worldly influences that have snuck into our beliefs. So today, we've reached chapter 2. Chapter 1 tells us all about creation. The first six days, the work week of God, if you will. <clears throat> today, we get into chapter 2. Chapter 2, as with many things in Hebrew literature, it tells you the story, and then it goes back and tells you the story again. But when it repeats, it enlarges, and it gives you more detail than you had before. So today we're going to review and enlarge on, or begin to, I should say, review and enlarge on creation and what happened. And I have the same serious request that I've asked you every time when we started this series. Forget what you think you know about creation and let us come back and take time to look into the scripture and see what scripture says. Because isn't scripture the ultimate authority? Good, I see people shaking their heads up and down. Okay, think with me then. Because this is another error, and, and I'm not going to... This actually wasn't one of the extra messages, but maybe it bears repeating anyway. If, and when I use if today, I mean since, God was able to do everything required to put everything of creation in place, right? We read that in the first chapter. Isn't he just as capable, hear me clearly, isn't he just as capable of assuring that his word comes down to us, complete, inerrant, infallible and with absolute authority even though it was written by men and it has been preserved by men wasn't God able to carry it through history and bring it to us so that in other words we have his words preserved just exactly as he intended them to be even given mankind's frailties and foibles I believe so, and that's kind of where I'm coming from. So if that's the case, then shouldn't we then accept the words that are written before us that God preserved to bring down to us at their face value, in their ordinary primary meaning, unless there's something in the context that tells you, oh no, I can't take that in a literal fashion. It's a figure of speech, particularly when it comes to poetry, prose, and different things like that. It's a figure of speech, it's an idiom, uh, or some other point of language that causes us to know, okay, I've got to look at this a little differently. I can't read it exactly like it's there. And so we need to look for another interpretation, but only when we know that we need to look for another interpretation. So last time we finished it with Genesis 1.31. We finished up chapter 1. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was the evening, and there was the morning, the sixth day. So creation completed, and God said it was very good. And we have absolutely no idea how long it stayed that way. But he had six days, and it was very good. We have the culmination of God's creation, humanity, the last thing created. And humans are living in a perfect world. The climate is just right. There's plenty of food at hand. 
the animals are in their proper relationship with man. Man has dominion over all of them. Adam can walk up and pet a lion if he wanted to. Wouldn't be a problem. Or a tiger, whatever. With no fear of attack. And we could speculate that since creation was very good, as God said, that Satan had not yet fallen. That the rebellion and the fall of Satan had not yet occurred because creation was completed during this unrecorded period. We don't know exactly what went on after the completion of, of creation, but it was very good. If there was a sinful being running around causing issues, would creation have been said very, very good? So were the angels created during this period? I mean, part of, their, part of the reason for angels is to serve as ministering spirits to aid humanity. If there's no humanity, then there's no need to have aiding spirits. We don't know. Those are items for another message. I just put them in there to put a little seed and let it grow a little bit. We'll come back and cultivate that later. And add to that another item of speculation. We don't know how long it was that Adam was alone, but once we get a little further into this, we won't get to it today, but there comes a point where God looks at creation and he says, it is not good. Creation was not good. I'll give you a little preview. It's not good that man is alone, but we don't know how long man was alone. But at some point, man was alone and God said, that's not good and I need to fix it. <clears throat> So for, at least from that point, and I don't think that was a terribly long time, and from the point that Eve was made, I don't know how long a time it was, but I don't think it was an extremely long time because I don't mean to be crude here at all, but mankind being what mankind is and God being what he is, God created sex when he created you know, male and female. And mankind being what mankind is, and there were no children mentioned yet, I can't think it was an extremely long time, but I don't know. And there's another little item I'll bring up, but I'll bring it up at another time. So let's continue with the story where we're supposed to be in chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. And I read this scripture earlier, so I won't go further. Now normally I like the... Legacy Standard Bible. I've been using it all year. But as I'm working through Genesis chapter 2, there's a couple things that are making me wonder about the decision. There's places where I think their word choice is less than ideal. And I expect there are always to be passages where I'm going to have to go into the original language and I'm going to have to explain something, some nuance in the original language that doesn't really come very easily over into English or some cultural difference that made that word mean a little something different in the culture to which it was written than it does in our culture today. I expect to have to do that. But when I have to translate a poorly chosen word in English, a poorly chosen English word, to, to get you the idea uh, of what's going on, and make, sometimes it makes me wonder if I've made a right decision and makes me wonder if I should go back to the translation that I've used previously. But Maybe I belabor that too much. But case in point here, it says in verse 1 that thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their starry hosts. You probably have something else in your translation. Perhaps you do. But what host? All their hosts. Is it starry host? And I think I just maybe misspoke when I read that verse. Is it starry host? Is it angelic host? That's a possibility, but the Hebrews believe uh, that uh, angels were created on the second day, is the way most Hebrew uh, biblical scholars, Torah scholars believe. Now, why am I bothering this with this? Well, because I figure if I'm confused, you're confused, and so we need to straighten it out, right? And then again, maybe you just didn't worry about it and you just moved on. But the Hebrew word that's used there is translated by 13 different English words, all the way from armies to warfare, and several things in between. So it's kind of understandable that it's applied to, in Deuteronomy 4.19, it's translated as the starry host. 
In 1 Kings 22, 19, it's translated the angelic host or refers to the angelic host. In Exodus 12, 41, it refers to the hosts of Israel. So it's a group. But obviously here, it's not referring to the host of Israel. Adam and, Adam's just been created. Eve's not even on the picture yet. So the Septuagint, when I say that, have you learned what I'm talking about yet? The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, so bringing it into Greek, the Greek word chosen for there is the word cosmos, which comes into English fairly easily, and we understand what that means. So if you examine the context, and when you examine context, what you mean by that is you look at the entire context. You look at the verse, the verses that are adjacent to the verse, the chapter that the verse is found in, the book that the chapter is found in, and then how does that compare to the whole of scripture. It seems that the best translation is the idea of a host in marching order or everything in its place. Uh, a company of persons or things, as the definition goes, a company of persons or things in the order of their nature. And so as such, the Christian Standard Bible translates this verse, so the heavens and earth and everything in them were completed. Okay, Everything in the heavens, everything on earth, just a single and unambiguous everything, regardless of creation, wherever it was, whether it was the stars or all of the animals, all the creatures that are on the earth, everything. So once all of creation is done, God's completed all his work, and he rested on the seventh day, it says. And why did he rest? Was he tired? He'd been, he'd been creating for three days. He needed to have a lie down. No, he did not. He did it as an example to mankind. He worked six days and then he rested. Scripture says God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The Hebrew word that's used there is to set apart, to be treated as holy. Now, granted, in the New Covenant, we have moved that day of worship from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to the first day of the week. Why? Because we celebrate the resurrection. So there's an argument to be made for that. But the thing is, in that movement, do we have a day that we treat as holy? Okay. Do, do we have a day that's completely different from every other week, every other day in the week? Somewhere we've lost even the knowledge of what that means. I mean, the original instructions, original instructions were in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, let me stop right there. Holy means set apart. Let me give you an example. See, when we think of holy, we think of God's holiness and his purity and all of that thing. Holiness, being something being holy means set apart. The other things are kind of added on, but just set apart. Today's a good day to talk about this because today is Communion Sunday for us, okay? We have this item here. What do you want to call it? Dish, vessel, whatever it is. This is only ever used for one purpose. It is set apart for that purpose. It's in storage the rest of the time. If we're not having communion, we don't see this. It's not part of what's out. It is set apart for a purpose. It is holy unto our Lord's Supper observance. So think, set apart. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahweh your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female slave, or your cattle or your sojourner who is within your gates. Why? For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And if that wasn't clear enough, it's repeated in Exodus 35. Then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, These are the things that Yahweh has commanded you to do. Six days' work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath day of complete rest. 
What kind of rest? I don't make you do this much. What kind of rest? Complete rest. Now, is there any reason we should take that word to mean anything other than what complete means? No. A day of complete rest to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. I'm not trying to be condemnatory here, okay? Just want you to think. I hear you guys sometimes saying, oh, I got to get home. I got this chore or that chore I got to do. Okay? Do you understand that in ancient Israel that would have got you killed? <laughs> you could have been stoned for that? But, Pastor, we're not under law, we're under grace. Didn't you think it? What did Jesus say? Matthew 5:17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. How about another one? Paul was instructing the Romans. Do we then abolish the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. And now I need to preach a message on the finer points of the law in the age of grace, okay? Salvation by the law was never gonna happen, okay? That part of the law was to bring us to grace. It was to make us realize there was no way we were ever gonna be good enough to come into God's presence, and there had to be another way. But the rules of life that are given in the law, they haven't been totally abolished, and we shouldn't think that they have. Someone said the other day that they had a problem being still. How important is that, being still? It's something that our current culture knows very little about, right? Yet even God was, I mean, can't we say it? God was still on the seventh day. Isn't that part of what rest is? Now, we'll be showing our age when we say this, but we all know how old we are. How many of you remember the time when you couldn't even buy a gallon of milk on Sunday? The blue laws were still in effect. You know what the blue laws were? That was a cultural acceptance and at least an outward respect for the day that God had set aside. But you see, that kind of required us to be still. You had to make preparations. Just like if you look at the Hebrews, there were preparations they had to make to be ready for the Sabbath day. Back then you had to make, you know, if you, need, if you were going to need milk, you best go buy it on Saturday. You made preparation for the day and it required you to rest. To be still now in our current society, or for us to be still, maybe I should say it this way, for us to be still, we individually need to rebel against our current society, right? Sometimes we may even need to rebel against the expectations of family or friends which that in itself may not be a bad thing. My point is that often we can't be still simply because we've forgotten how to be still. We've forgotten how to rest. But it's something that God purposely did as an example for us. You see, when we are still, the Holy Spirit can more easily speak into our lives because there are less distractions. I, there's a saying I use when I describe people that are so busy. If you're running down the road 90 miles an hour with your hair on fire, you cannot hear what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. Some people are busy because they don't want to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. And perhaps it's because of our culture that we don't remember how to rest or how to meditate. And even the word meditate worries us. Because that's something new age people and mystics do. We don't want to have any part of that stuff. Well, it's another message altogether, too, but you'd be surprised how much new age stuff has snuck into the church. And we've swallowed it, thinking it's Christian. And it's not. As I was preparing this message, I was sorely tempted, right here, to put it, and it's interesting because this came up in, in the first hour, and I was sitting there, maybe even chuckling, not to myself, but I was sitting there chuckling because I started to take, I started to put into here, 
five minutes of silence. Remember when we were mentioning that down in the first hour? I was going to put five minutes of silence in here. And pretty much the only reason I didn't is for the sake of the people that join us by video. They weren't going to sit through five minutes of, of quiet video. I could have edited it out, but I thought it would be a good exercise for us. I was considering presenting with you with two verses, which that I am going to do, and have you sit there and meditate on it for five minutes. I think if I did that, I think my next comment, I think I would, if I went further, I would be stealing from the point I want to make next. So look at this. You will keep perfectly peaceful. Could we say restful or still there? You will keep perfectly peaceful the one whose mind remains focused on you because he remains in you. It's Isaiah 26.3. You know it probably in a different version. You may have memorized it. There's another one. And the, the other one, we normally know that what we know about it, we, it begins with two words, be still. Look at two different translations. The Legacy Standard Bible says, cease striving. Stop fighting against the culture. Stop fighting against all the things that are distracting you. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. I like this one better. Be in awe and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted throughout the earth. But Pastor, there's three verses up there. Yes, there are. But two of them are the same verse. It's that the ISV translation was too good not to share with you guys. International Standard Version, in case you're wondering what that is. Looking at the translation from the International Standard Version, apparently there is something about God's awesome presence that should yield itself to stillness. If you wonder about that, do a research every time God showed up in Scripture. People wound up very still, flat on their face. Okay, but back to our, my, my five-minute challenge, I consider. Now, admit it. Long before we reached the five-minute mark, you would have perhaps fallen asleep, like a couple of you trying to do. I won't say who. Or you'd be, at the very least, you'd be squirming in your seats. You'd be thinking, now, come on, Pastor, get on with it. I got stuff to do this afternoon, or you need to hurry up so we don't have to wind up on the waiting list at the restaurant. Something like that. Five minutes with God is such an enormous task for those trained to, to expect now what has become. Have you noticed how many commercials have now become 15 second sound bites? That's why they wear us out, because it's the same amount of time it used to put in three or four commercials, and now there's, I don't know, 12, 15, whatever it is. Can I be real honest with you? I tried this, knowing what I was trying to do to myself. I made it three minutes before I looked at my watch. It's hard. It is really, really hard. And yet the purpose built into creation and then commanded by regulation, but for our own good, is the idea of rest, is the idea of stillness. Could we say this prayer, just offering it as a suggestion, Lord, once again, teach us how to rest, how to enjoy being in your company, and being refreshed in body, mind, and spirit teach us the stillness that we should have? Okay. I won't charge extra for that message, but let's get back to the one in Genesis where we belong, okay? These are the generations of the heavens. And since I read this earlier, I won't read it again. Generations. We finally reached that retelling and enlargement of the story of creation. Uh, I told you we'd get there. These are the generations. It's another word choice I question. Because if you look through the passage, 
there's none of the begats, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so and he lived this long and then he died and then this is go back to his son begat so-and-so. There's none of the begats that we expect when generations are recorded. Now, obviously, the word there can mean that. And honestly, it is most often translated genealogy or generations. And perhaps the LSB has chosen, because they're big about this, trying to have continuity. When a word occurs, they try to, to translate it the same way throughout Scripture. So maybe that's what they're trying to do here. But it can also mean other things. It can mean accounts or record. And doesn't these are the accounts or these are the records uh, of the heavens and earth? Doesn't that make better sense? These are the records of the God who initiated all this concerning how it was all accomplished. Does that make a better, better translation, a better introduction, what we're enter, entering into? And keep in mind in the retelling, certain liberties are taken with a timeline. It was chronological the first time through. Now we're just enlarging as we think on things. So follow me through the, the, through the passage. The heavens and earth, when they were created... That's mentioning Genesis 1, chapter one, uh, verses 1 through 6. Then it talks about no shrub of the field, no plant had occurred. That happened on the third day of creation. For Yah Yahweh God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. We'll come back to this in a second. There was no man to cultivate the ground. Okay, at this point in the, in the uh, point of creation, man hadn't been created yet, but the retelling does tell us there was no man to cultivate the ground. So apparently when man did come around, part of what he was supposed to do was to cultivate the ground. And we'll find this mentioned in other places. But it wasn't that Adam was created perfect, put in a perfect paradise garden with nothing to do. God created man to work. It's just that before the curse, Work wasn't the four-letter word that it is today. It was an occupation. It was a vocation that God gave to man. It was something he did, and he enjoyed doing it. It's at the curse that it became work, as we know it. Then it said, but a stream would rise up. The LSB says that. Now, out of nine modern English translations I looked at, six of them translate this word mist. Three of them translate it as stream or spring. Now, the Septuagint uses a Greek word for spring, and I think the English translations that use that were probably influenced by the Greek translation. And I pause to belabor this again because there are a fair few uh, theologians that believe that the first time there was rain on the earth was in the day of Noah. Noah. That it hadn't rained before then. I happen to be one of those. Uh, until then, the earth was watered by a mist. So if you, if you read that, uh, scientifically, <coughs> excuse me, you remember back in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, God separated the waters above from the waters below and made this firmament? Okay, well, scientifically, the thick blanket of water vapor, the atmosphere, which was done on, that was the second day of creation, it made for no rain cycle in there. Uh, do you guys back in the, when was it, 70s, that terrariums were really popular? And we're showing our age again, aren't we? Okay. But, you know, you, if you had the right amount of moisture in there and you kept it sealed, it took care of itself. It's kind of the idea here. There would be a ground fog, a heavy dew or, or condensation at ground level that watered the earth. I can't be dogmatic on this. I can't say this is absolutely positively the way it, has, it can be. It can't be any other way. So if you want to disagree with me, go ahead. We won't, we won't fall out. But I think there was the mist that came up and watered the ground. And the first time it rained is when Noah saw it. But that's another story for a different time. For the sake of time, I'm going to have to make this point my takeaway. Verse 7, then Yahweh formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and so the man became a living being. Remember, this was the last act of creation 
on the last day of creation that God did. No other thing that God created did he breathe into it the breath of life. They were just made. They were alive. With me so far? Okay. Buckle up for about five minutes and follow me as I make an obscure but very, very important point. Okay? Yahweh God formed man from dust or of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Am I doing any injustice to the text if I say God breathed into Adam? Remember that was man, the Hebrew word. God breathed into Adam and life came into him. Am I doing any injustice to the text? I think not. And so with that being a perspective, God breathed into this dust and made man a living being. What does that do for you for this? What does that do to your consideration of 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Scripture tells us the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Did you really think about it being living when you read that scripture? God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. What happened when God breathed into his word? It's a living writing like nothing else on earth. Empowered like nothing else on earth. Just like mankind is different from every other being in creation or creature of creation, whatever term you want to use. Scripture is different than any other writing that has ever come about, regardless of how inspired it might have been. It's different. So ponder about that when you wonder, well, now is Scripture really right? Well, I started this by saying, Shouldn't we accept that the God who created everything is able to bring to us his book as he wanted us to have it in a way that we can understand it? For the most part, there's some pieces that make you scratch your head. And that's why God made pastors, teachers, and such. But the book we should be using to talk to people is empowered in a way that nothing else is. And as we use it, we are speaking the power of God. Now, I'm not getting all hocus-pocus and charismatic on you, okay? None of that. But we're speaking God's word. God said his word would never go forward and not accomplish the purpose which he had in mind. So I think it behooves us to know as much of it as we can possibly know since it is breathed, God breathed in the same way that man was God breathed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we indeed look at this and compare these ideas, Father, that you breathed into Adam, the first man, and made him a living creature. And Lord, you breathed into your word, and you made it powerful. Lord, able to divide spirit and bring us before you, Lord. So teach us your word. Teach us the use of your word. May we be skillful in the use. Lord, give us the wisdom we need to know how to use it. Lord, may we open our hearts to your Holy Spirit so you might guide us in the use of us to bring those around us into your kingdom as you have commanded to us, instructed to us. May we be skillful artisans of the use of your word in Christ's name. Amen. Lessons for the Journey is recorded during the services of New Journey Church in Midlothian, Virginia, where Dr. Clifton is pastor. You may access other messages at the website www.lessonsforthejourney.org. If you would like to contact the ministry, you may do so by sending email to mail at lessonsforthejourney.org. If you find these messages helpful, please consider subscribing to the channel, and clicking the thumbs up. These actions will alert the YouTube algorithm to suggest these recordings to other viewers, and grow the channel. Join us again next week, when we will continue learning more, Lessons for the Journey.